Hi, welcome to Infusion Health, the podcast. I'm comedian Chris Patrick, a.k.a. Self-Proclaimed Power Man. And I'm here with my co-host and significant other, Rach. Hey, guys. Now, today we're talking about um, diversity in the workplace, uh, working with different um, different races, different cultures, and uh, how that actually uh, goes about in the workplace and how you uh, can <laughs> help me out, Rach, how you can... A level of acceptance. Uh, acceptance in the workplace. Um and we have on the phone Shauna Gann, and she's a business psychologist. She's calling in from D.C., the metro area. And uh, Shauna, uh, welcome to the show. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem. So um, so as far, as far as diversity in the workplace, um, you're a business psychologist. Exactly what, what exactly do you do to help? I mean, do you, like, work with people, help with different diversities or... Yeah, it, it can be kind of tricky to sort all of that out as people are just sort of coming to understand what DEI or diversity, equity, inclusion at work is. Mm-hmm. So while my specialty is in business psychology, I truly focus on what it means to have a fair and equitable workplace for people with all different backgrounds. Um, but I really like to zero in on equity for people who have been historically marginalized, whether that's because of their race, their ethnicity, their ability, or just other aspects of their identity. So I support by, um, you know, doing some uh, analysis or assessments in a workplace. I also provide training and coaching, things like that to help bring people along what we call their DEI journey. Just, you know, become better human beings for folks at work. Yeah. So, so like with working with working with different cultures, different different diversity. Because I know, I know it's a lot. There's there's a lot of different uh, different races. Especially when I worked um, when I worked at the casino, there was a lot of different races um, you had to work with at at the um, when I was working at the casino. And you know, for me, it's always been kind of uh, an educational thing because I you know I talk to people and it's like so you know what do you do? Where are you from? You know how how is this different from there and stuff like that. So I've never been offended by but i know there's some people who do get offended by you know uh you know you may be working with somebody who's somalian or somebody's from you know africa east africa or somebody's from liberia you know the way they dress the way they talk and and just like uh old culture thinking of what a black person acts like what a hispanic acts like and that's the main reason why i wanted to have this podcast to open up the mind and start changing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those are some really good points. And I guess one very important thing to kind of consider right off the bat is that even though people might be from a similar place, that doesn't mean that they are going to come with their own, with the same exact culture or um, level of openness, right? Because we're all individuals. But part of that is getting to know and be exposed to people from different places and who hold different beliefs and, and practices with their culture. So that, that is part of it. And, you know, research has actually shown that the more we expose ourselves to different kinds of people, the more open-minded and accepting we are. Just because, as many folks have experienced, a lot of people fear the unknown or just sort of reject what they don't understand and if we don't spend time to get to know other people you know you, you don't really get a very open accepting place where people feel like they belong and that, that's a true thing too is uh people you know we we want to mock and we want to uh we want to ridicule things we don't understand like you may work some work with somebody who is um of the muslim faith and you know you go into the you go into the room to change you go into a certain room and there they are on their knees you know praying to mecca and all that and my thing has always been like ask questions like, you know, um, what are you guys doing? Oh, we're praying them. Oh, okay. Okay. But then when I research, oh, you got to do that three times a day. Okay. I get it. You know? mm-hmm. Oh yeah. I'm so glad you said that too, because sometimes we really put the onus on people to educate us. But I love that you said you did the research because also it can be pretty taxing, you know, mentally, <laughs> emotionally, and, eventually even physiologically for people to always be asking you to explain yourself and your culture and while that's part of getting to know someone i think it's important that we take responsibility to educate ourselves so i love that you said that you know Mm -hmm. doing the research part that's Mm -hmm. so important 
Well, I think a part of accepting is also understanding that people came from all over the world into the United mm-hmm. States through centuries of doing this, no matter how they got there. And I think it's important to understand that if we as Americans went over to their culture, what we do every single day would be different to them. Yeah, uh, 100%. In fact, if it's okay that I share this, yeah. one pretty huge part of my work that I do comes from my own experiences of travel. So my, my husband was in the military for about almost 26 years, and I we just celebrated 25 years together. So I've been with him most of that time, and 15 of those years were overseas. We lived in Europe and in Asia um, for 15 years in these different places, different cultures and talk about culture shock. You know, uh, we are privileged as Americans because much of the world kind of will contort themselves specifically when it comes to like business and things like that to meet this Western ideal, whether that's making sure that somebody there speaks English for you, even if you're in a country that's not an English speaking country or, you know, that they've got sort of things to, to make you feel comfortable. And we take a lot of that for granted as Americans but then going there with a fresh set of eyes, like, oh, my gosh, this is a completely different way of being. But, like, actually taking the time and having the interest in learning those different things, when you bring that back with you to the U.S., like, it's impossible to not see the way we operate here through that new lens, right? Because there are so many folks that come here and assimilate and um unfortunately are expected to assimilate Mm. but you go out of our country and experience and i'm not talking about just like a vacation right like not i'm not talking about backpacking through europe or something like (laughs) Like, i mean really living uh, you know on the economy being with people within the culture and it does change um your perspective i think well yeah that's that kind of what happened to me i was i was working a job a few years ago back in like the early nineties. And I ended up meeting my friend, Tony. Um, Tony's from uh, Vietnam and he had, he had to escape Vietnam to come here to America. And so, but he came here, uh, was ended up getting married, having three kids, all that, and, and um, working a job. And he goes back every few years to see his family. And one time he said, you know, would you want to go with? And I'm like, yeah, cause I, I love the travel. But when I went there, the experience and all that was, you know, I mean, was, <laughs> was priceless because I learned, I learned so much and I found out, you know, the apartment I was living at the time, I was living in a two bedroom, two bathroom apartment. And I looked at, I looked at my apartment when I got back and I thought, well, this could sleep like seven or eight people if this was in Vietnam. Okay. You know, so, and it really, really made me appreciate what we have here because things, things are way, are, are different in Vietnam. I still had a good time, but it, it was just a learning experience. Yeah. For sure. That's awesome that you had that experience too. Oh yeah. 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 It was great. I mean, but that's the thing too, is, you know, when you, when you, um, like you said, people want to, want to, you know, down or, or something that they don't understand because, you know, back in, you know, the, the elementary, you know, uh, middle school, high school days, you know, people, you know, somebody would come in and be like, Oh, that person's this. I'm like, have you even talked to them? Do you know anything about what they're about? No, no. All right. Well then, how are you talking about and making fun of them when you know nothing about what they're about? Yeah. Sadly, you know, a lot of those biases and the stereotypes that people adopt come from the media that people consume. But even our own families and friends, you know, growing up, right. you mm-hmm. just kind of hear things. Somebody's telling a joke and you look around you and you see socially, oh, I'm supposed to laugh at that. So you learn to laugh at things like that. It's not like you're born mm-hmm. thinking right. these things, right? Mm-hmm. And so part of my job is to help people sort of unravel that and Mm -hmm. dissect, gosh, where are these biases coming from? And how can I, you know, mitigate that? How can I stop myself from acting on this? Because, by the way, everybody's got biases. Like, that's not a bad thing. It's just a thing. It's how you deal with it Mm -hmm. and, you know, where you can sort of put up the blockers and check yourself. You're like, oh, wait. Did I make this decision or did I say this thing or did I X, Y, Z because of some thing that I got stored in my head or do I have really a logical reason for this? And Mm. it's sort of just making yourself more aware of that so you can challenge yourself. 
So we all come with it. And it often comes from sort of those childhood things, the jokes people make or mm-hmm. stuff. I mean, how many TV shows or movies, if you go back and you look, sometimes I do this. Oh my gosh. Go back and look at movies or TV shows made in like 70s, 80s. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. You're like, really? Like that, imagine trying to air that now. And even you go back and look at some Disney films and they'll put a little um, disclaimer at the front and be like, this was made, you know, and that so it's like, we do yeah, not yeah. support these things or, or whatever. Because you know, you look at it and you're like, that did not age well. Yeah. Because we, we, thank goodness, we know better. But then if you never, ever check those things, it'll just proliferate, sadly. Mm-hmm. And I think it's important to move our conversation forward into what is actually happening in America, not just like the people that are coming from different cultures now and different countries, but the acceptance of African Americans as they who they are so that they don't have to transform themselves when they're out of work versus when they're in work and also with any other person of color um we get these social thoughts in our head well that person shouldn't really act like that at work but why are you asking them to be someone that they are not if they are a hard worker Mm -hmm. you should be taking yourself and understanding who they are yeah a hundred percent and and it's not just people of color it it can be any identity you think Mm -hmm. about people who I identify as being part of the LGBTQIA plus mm-hmm. community. You know, there's the thing, there's masking and covering, and you've probably heard of code switching. And, you know, masking or covering is when you just kind of hide some aspects. Because there's some parts of you that are obviously visible, right? Like right. those are going to be visibly identifiable characteristics. But there's a lot of stuff about us that's invisible that nobody would know unless we actually shared that with people. And so masking is like just making sure that those invisible things don't come out, right? You cover that up. You cover it up. But mm. then code switching is like when we ask people to assimilate, to be somebody else or act a certain way, talk a certain way, dress a certain way. And one of the things, so I, I did this study um, for my doctoral program. My dissertation study was about black multiracial women and I don't have to go into detail about that unless you'd like me to but one of the things that came out of that was this aspect of what professionalism is and these women I spoke to 14 women and one of the things that they talked about was this idea of professionalism being actually what is white professionalism meaning their hair had to be straight for a certain way or um what was considered neat or considered professional dress really was something that the culture of that organization wanted. It doesn't mean that they were unprofessional right. or that the way they talked or even down to what food they brought. I spoke to one woman who um, she's black and, and Filipino. And she talked about like, I didn't want to tell anybody about my dinner or, you know, whatever she was bringing to lunch because they would not understand. So she didn't even talk to anybody because that didn't fit the culture of the company. And that's like a major red flag to me when I see um, job descriptions or people talking about interviewing or things like that. And they say they want people to be a culture fit. And it's like, eh, well, so does that mean they don't get to be themselves? Does that mean they have to hide some aspects of themselves or change some aspects of themselves to fit culturally here? And my, my whole thing is about being authentic and letting people show up as they are and who they are. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think you're right, Rach, like bringing that back to not just assimilating because you're from someplace else, but even within our own country. Yes. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Can people be who they are? Yeah. Well, well, there's, um, I think you need to elaborate a little bit more on that as far as being who you are, because when I'm when I'm with my friends or whatever and we're hanging out, we we talk a certain we talk a certain way, we talk a certain slang. But when I'm at work, mm-hmm. you have to be professional and I can't go I know I can't go in talking a certain slang and talking that because you, you gotta be professional. But so it's kinda like being who you are is one thing, but being who you are in the workplace, that's that's also another thing. Yeah, and that's a good point. So I guess what I mean is there, you want to be who you are that's appropriate for the setting. 
Mm-hmm. Right. So like, for example, I, I'm, I do a lot of consultancy, um, include that's part of the business psychology part. I do lots of analysis and things like that. If I'm sitting down with a client and I'm starting to explain some of the processes that I've done or, or what we're working with, but I use a lot of jargon, like they're going to be lost and it's not going to feel good. It's not going to be comfortable. So I obviously want to speak using terms that are lay terms or that are common where the person doesn't have to feel like either a I'm talking down to them in some way because I'm using all this like tech you know technological language to discuss something and b like I want to connect with them so using all this jargon is not going to fit so if you replace that with like the idea of slang right Mm -hmm. that would also be troublesome in terms of communication Mm -hmm. now if you were like on your lunch break or whatever and you wanted to speak that way like whatever that's who you are but what i'm talking about when i say come authentically meaning and there's a (laughs) it's kind of a bizarre movie but there's a movie called sorry sorry to bother you came out i think in 2020 and if anybody wants to check it out like just hold on because it's a wild ride but (laughs) the part (laughs) that i want to address is Um, it's basically about this call center and these people want to be able to be promoted because when you get promoted, you go up to this upper floor and supposedly it's like all glorious and there's all these like amazing benefits. But the guy, this this guy, he's a, he's a black man. He's trying really hard to make these sales, but he like, he calls and the reason calls are bother you because he's like, hello, sorry to bother you, but I'd like to check with you, blah, 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 whatever he's selling. And it never works. So people always hang up on him or whatever. And uh, I think it's Danny Glover. I always mix him up. The guy, well, anyway, he's like next to him, another black man. And he's like, that's because you haven't put on your voice. And he's like, what? So he shows him. He called. And um, I, I'm so sorry. I don't remember this actor's name. But if you've ever seen like Arrested Development, he plays Tobias. He's the, he's the voice actor. That's, he's a white man. He, his voice changes him he becomes like the voice for this and suddenly people are interested he's like you got to put on your white voice mm-hmm. and the, the rest of the movie sort of you know kind of builds on this aspect nobody should have to put on a white voice <laughs> to be mm-hmm. successful at work <laughs> yes so not using slang or not overusing jargon that's one thing right mm-hmm. but to completely have to change who you are is another and i guess that's what i mean you know, when people feel like, oh, we we don't really get you or we don't really hang out. because you know, and, and so a person feels like they have to completely change the way they talk, even in an everyday sort of situation, not even playing. Hmm. That's that's what I mean. And, and it happens every it single day. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, um, 20 years ago, there was less cornrows in the workplace. Now we're seeing more of it in my field, you know, different types of hairstyles and stuff like that, because we're opening up our minds to what is it actually accepted. Well, absolutely. And and now in some states, it's the law, the Crown Act makes it so you can't discriminate against people because of their hairstyle. Mm-hmm. You know, speaking of things like cornrows, I, I mentioned my husband served in the military the, the military had this very specific idea of what a professional hairstyle should be for women serving. And, you know, if women had on, you know, had their hair in cornrows or other natural styles or protected styles, which might be like braids or some other styles, then it was not considered professional and they had to take it out. And, and think about, you've probably seen over time in the news, like even kids who have been kicked out of school yes. because of their hair, yeah. right? So the Crown Act protects people against that. It's like, wait a second. And how about this? Just recently, I know we're not talking about this so much, but just think about how bias and stereotype can actually impact someone's health. We just found out how bad chemical hair relaxers are for yeah. people. Yeah. In fact, like black women showing up with cancer because years and years and years and years of chemically straightening the hair. Maybe some people like to chemically straighten the hair, but a lot of people did that because it was trying to sort of gain this proximity to whiteness because that was what is favored and therefore rewarded. Mm. Right. So like in just trying to assimilate to white culture in America, 
literally women's health is in danger <laughs> and, yeah. you know, and at risk just trying to meet some ideal. No, um, Oprah herself, when she first started, had burned some holes in her mm, hair because she was chemically straightening it to look more presentable to the white community. Mm-hmm. Presentable as an acceptable, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Well, there, because well, it's that whole like proximity to whiteness. Mm. Well, there, there was a few cases where a few years ago, like um, a lady went to work. I think she was a receptionist or something, but she went to work and she had dreadlocks and the rest of the people got together and, um, and passed a, um, not a bill, but passed a, um, a change the dress code as far as you can't wear dress, you can't wear dreadlocks. And then there was another kid, he was a wrestler. And before they would let him wrestle, he was actually at a, at a meet about the wrestle. And they told him he had, he had his hair, he had his hair pulled back and all that. They told him you got to cut your hair before you can wrestle. And he was, so I remember that. Yep. And he, was he, so he had his hair. Yep. Yeah. And he, mm-hmm. they, they, he ended up cutting his hair. He ended up winning the match, but they were saying that that referee should be fired because in the rules, it's like his hair was pulled back. It wasn't down below his, you know, and how, and how is that different from like somebody white with a ponytail or something like that? You know, you got to pull right. it, you got to pull it back. So, yeah. So there, yep. there have been cases about that. Yeah. And, and just think about the emotional repercussions of that, right? Like for, for a lot of us, our hair is a major part of our identity. Yep. And so to be told that you have to cut your hair like that, just to do, just do something that everybody, you know, like he had every right to participate in yeah. that match. But that was, that was the repression. So like walking away from that, sure, maybe he won that match. But what is the long-term impact of that? Mm-hmm. By literally having to change who you are to participate in an activity that you already have the right to participate in. Well, so all of those examples, like those are the kinds of barriers that I work to break down in workplaces. Mm-hmm. How do you start those yeah. conversations with the people that tend to be more ignorant um, mm-hmm. or not just not um, starting to open their mind to accept them? Yeah. Well, the first thing is, um, I like to tell folks, and this one's a very difficult one to swallow, but I don't like to use ignorance as a ticket, like, you know, like you're, you get a pass here because the root of ignorance is ignore. We, we live in a time where we have access to information, right? Just Chris, like you said, you did your research. Mm -hmm. There really isn't a reason now. There are very, very, very few exceptions to people, you know, with people who maybe don't have access to certain information, but most of us do. And so if you're, especially if you're working in corporate America, you have access to information. So I, I don't even like to say the whole ignorance thing. No, no, no. You have an opportunity to inform yourself. Now, beyond that, it's about determining, first of all, where the readiness level is mm-hmm. to even begin work. Um, Cause there's like this continuum, right? Where, where people are on their journey. Yeah. All the way from just people who are overtly, you know, practicing bigotry. Yes. To people who are practicing advocates and, and activists, right? There's a huge continuum in there. The first is to determine where people are in terms of their readiness to actually receive information. And the second is, this might come as a surprise, especially given where the focus usually is in America. But when it comes to working with folks with DEI, I actually don't really start with race. And that's because it is the most uh, contentious topic, whether you are a person who regularly is on the receiving side of oppressive behaviors or whether you're a person you like being oppressive, <laughs> like mm-hmm. doing the things, right? And so I usually start with something that most people can identify with, and that's ability. Because having abilities or disabilities can impact you no matter what country you're from, what your ethnic background is, what languages you speak, what religion you are. People can be temporarily disabled or permanently, you know, have permanent disabilities, visible ones, invisible ones. 
And since that's something that a lot of folks can relate to, whether it's they broke an arm or had surgery, mm-hmm. or, you know, they are a person um, who uses a wheelchair, um, that is a great way to open the door to understanding barriers and how we can even put barriers before people without even knowing it. And then moving there, like once people sort of like, okay, I get that, moving into other sorts of identities and then getting to race. Because by the time you've talked about some of these other things, people are often more ready to have those conversations and not just shut down. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times folks who feel like, look, I have been on the receiving side my whole life. You know, I'm, I'm afraid to drive my car. Like, they can get frustrated when I'm not immediately out the gate, like, all right, I'm about to tell everybody who's racist, who's not, you know, like they're ready for me to throw down. And I'm like, we stop now. We can't because if we, if we just come out the gate like that, who's going to shut down Mm -hmm. the people we most need to hear the message. Right. Right. And if I'm on the other side, like never talking about race, then people will think that, Oh, well, I'm a good person. So I'm not racist. And it's like, wait, racism, the racist behaviors, discrimination or discriminatory behaviors, that has nothing to do with being good or bad. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah. So that's how I start. I start with sort of these other identities to sort of give people some Velcro to hook onto when we get to the most difficult conversations. So, so how is things? How are things going now as far as uh, diversity in the workplace and so? Because I, because I know with my job, I think once a year we do we have to take a diversity a diversity training and all that, and it's <laughs> a lot of a lot of people don't want to be there, but it's one of those things because it's like usually on our day off or something like that, and it's like well you got to come in for diversity training, you know? Yeah. Well, it's an interesting time, Chris. <laughs> so. In 2020, when folks around the world were kind of shut in their homes or wherever they were because of COVID, Mm -hmm. and the world was exploding because of the murder of George Floyd, Yes, organizations were like, we have to do something. Oh, my gosh, we're going to stand in solidarity with our black employees. And, you know, everybody was quick to get that diversity training. The thing is, Diversity training alone is just a Band-Aid, right? Like, Mm -hmm. I can tell you all day long, you know, you should respect different people, get to know other people, expose yourself to different cultures, all all the things, but human beings like homeostasis. Most people just want to go back to what's easy and please, okay, you might walk out of a training like, oh my God, that was so enlightening. (laughs) But then three (laughs) days later, you're telling a joke that you shouldn't be telling, right? Like, Mm. And so there's, there's that piece. The other piece is it's now 2023. And since then, people have had trainings like your job. There's often these sort of mandatory trainings given, usually part of some HR p- package or something, right? Mm-hmm. But now so many companies think that they have fixed it. Oh, we had our trainings. We're good now. We all good, right? Yeah. Forgetting or not realizing perhaps that it really is an ongoing journey. It doesn't stop. Mm. You, you don't take a DEI training or unconscious bias training and suddenly everything's all better. Clearly not. Just turn on the news yeah. for like 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. So like, yeah. That is not the end. So it's a little tricky right now because I feel like if you're ever, if anyone's familiar with um, Cotter's steps of change when it comes to change management, the very first thing that has to happen is there has to be this sense of urgency, mm-hmm. right? Like nobody is going to change what they're doing. I'll, I'll give myself an example because I do not like going to the gym. I do not like going to the gym. I don't like going to the gym. I wish I did. I wish I did. When do I get myself to the gym? When I see those numbers creeping up or pants are fitting. Mm-hmm. Then there's a sense of urgency. And I'm like, oh, shoot, I better go work out. I better go. I better change what I'm eating or something. It usually isn't until something feels urgent that we do that. And in 2020, there was this huge sense of urgency. And right now, people aren't really feeling that same sense of urgency. So it's kind of frustrating because I want folks to know that, hey, look, this isn't over. It's not fixed because you had a speaker come in or you did a book club. Mm -hmm. 
or you have the mandatory training. So it's a challenge right now, to be honest, to, to help people see that this is ongoing work. There's still work to be done. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I always, th- I always think that, you know, like I said before, you know, when you're, when you're working with somebody of a different race, reli- you know, race, religion, or, you know, if they're part of the LBGP community, you know, it's like, you don't, you don't really know them until you, you know, until you sit down and talk to them, you know? So it, it's more of a thing of once you, once you talk to this person, once you get to know this person, you know, you realize that, Hey, this person's just like me, you know, um, I go home to a fiance, he goes home to, you know, his partner or she goes home to her partner. And it's like, you know, <laughs> but for me, it's like, I don't yeah. care. Long as she, long as she cleans her half, he or she cleans her, their half of the, their half of the building. I clean my side, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, and one thing to be aware of is exceptionalism, um, where we start to think because we've gotten to know one person that's a little bit different than us, that they're different yeah. than other people who are more like them. So just a little caveat to that, right? Like it is, yes, please do get to know other people and expand your, you know, friends or friendship circle. It doesn't have to be just people that are like you, but also beware that you don't still ascribe to certain, and not you when I say you, I mean like Mm -hmm. one should be aware that, you know, because they've gotten to know one person that's different than them, that they don't make that person an exception to some stereotype that they Mm -hmm. kind of subscribe to. Yeah, exactly. I hear you on that. Just because you know one one person, well, I'm accepting of all people now. No, you're not. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) yeah. Yeah. Or just be careful, you know, like just because you got that one friend, (laughs) or that because this has been said, you people might be, you know, like, oh, but you're not like other fill in the blank. Yeah, yeah. I've had that a lot. Oh, well, you're different. You're not like the blank that I know, whatever that identity is. Yeah. 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 Like, and like you said, the the media can, can put up a lot of false. Cause I, I get that too, being, you know, being African-American people are like, well, you don't act like, you know, African-Americans. I'm like, well, what do you mean? Well, you don't do this. You don't, I'm like, well, not all. You don't African- talk like that. You don't act like that. You like your yeah. rock music. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and, I, and I tell people, <laughs> well, you know, everybody acts differently, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So true. Yeah. Well, this has been uh, an interesting conversation. Um, Is there a website or something? If if somebody had questions, they can find you, Shauna. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So my company is True Colors Consulting. So folks can find me at truecolorsdei.com or on LinkedIn, Shauna Gann on LinkedIn. Okay. And in the show notes. And those will be in the show notes. <laughs> and like I said, this is an interesting conversation. So, and everybody out there, you're working with people who are different and learn to accept them and, um, you know, just talk to them, have a conversation. As Marvin Gaye said, <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. You're going to sing to us? <laughs> <laughs> nah, I'm not what's a singer. What's going on? Okay. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not a, I'm not a singer. <laughs> so, so I'll let, um, I'll let Rach close us out. You guys, we're coming you, to guys. a close. Of course, um, we're coming to a close, and I want to appreciate that we had Sean on here. And just because it's your norm doesn't mean it's their norm, and it's time to open your mind and a little bit of, mm, learn a little bit about them. Have a great one. Take it easy.